Hello and welcome to this Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. I'm your host, Leah Rosen, the online editor for Bioprocess International. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. This webcast is being recorded and will be made available for replay in the multimedia section of our website. We've muted the audio lines, but we welcome you to type in your questions for our speaker in the chat window on your screen. After the presentation, we will begin the question and answer portion and I will ask our speakers your questions from the chat window. Your questions in the chat window will only be visible to myself and our speakers. So thank you for joining us today. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers, Joseph Abad and Vishal Agrawal. Thank you for the introduction, Leah. Hello, everyone. My name is Joseph Abad, and I am the West Coast Application Scientist for MaxSci. Before introducing our main speaker, I'd like to spend a few minutes to tell you about the MaxSci technology and the unique approach that we have taken to cellular transfection. So MaxSci has been around since 1999, and the technology was developed by a spin-up company from Harvard University. Our technology was developed for clinical use, and therefore, our focus has always been providing a safe, non-viral approach to loading molecules like DNA and RNA into challenging cell types with high efficiency and high cell viability post transfection Max-type cell loading technology is based on electroporation that uses a chemical-defined buffer and animal component free, and this buffer works for all cell types. The Maxi technology has been adopted by many biopharmaceutical companies for its versatility. You can use the technology to modify cell genome using technologies like CRISPR-Cas9. Some companies use the technology for making viral vectors for gene therapy, like AAV and LENC. Currently, we have one commercial immunotherapy, 15-plus licenses for clinical development, and over 40 partnered programs in the uh, gene and cell therapy space. We also have many clients that use the technology to express recombinant proteins like antibodies and antigens with varying scales from 10 milligrams to multigrams amounts using the flow electroporation technology. Our technology is agnostic and you can use any choice train um, of your choice and any uh, media combinations for your cell culture. Some companies also use the technology for um, expression of ion channels in GPCRs, which are typically difficult to express. And we have several other webinars and publications at maxfit.com showing these capabilities. The technology is an excellent addition in a tool in your toolbox, and we can provide solutions for difficult to transpect cell lines and difficult to express protein. These are two of the three instruments that we have. The one on the top is called the SCX that can transpect from half a million to 20 billion cells in less than 30 minutes. The instrument on the bottom of your screen is called the VLX that can transpect from 200 billion cells and people are using this one for AAV and vaccine production, for example. These two instruments are scalable, um, have shown scalability within this range of half a million to 200 billion cells. These are the list of our 80 plus uh, cell lines that we have optimized using the MaxAid system from CHO cells to CAP cells to insect cells to fibroblasts uh, to zero cells. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Vishal Agrawal from Biomarine in Nevada, California. MaxAid has worked with Biomarine since 2013 providing support for the MaxSite platform to ensure that it is performing optimally in their hands to help advance their development projects. Dr. Agrawal, we look forward to learning more about the exciting work you are doing at Biomarine. Thank you, Joseph, for the kind introduction. I would also like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present. Today, I will be talking about the application of an emerging technology called targeted locus amplification, <clears throat> which we have used for genetic characterization of recombinant CHO cells expressing therapeutic lysosomal enzyme. As an introduction to those who don't know about Biomarin, we are a commercial stage multinational biotech company that develops treatments for rare genetic diseases that mostly affect children. This is a special year for Biomarin, 
as we are celebrating our 20th anniversary in 2017. The two pictures I'm showing you here will give you a good idea of patient-centric approach that embodies the core of everything that we do. On the left is 10 years old Ryan Dent, receiving aldurazine for MPS1 disorder. MPS1 is a rare genetic lysosomal storage disorder where affected patients suffer a number of symptoms, including progressive mental retardation. With a lifespan of just about 10 years, it's a devastating disease for both patients and families. Ryan was warned by doctors to be alive no more than 10 years of age, and it's amazing to see that he recently celebrated his graduation in 2017, thanks to all his hard work and great science behind Eldorazine. Biomarin has multiple clinical and preclinical candidates in the product pipeline. We have six FDA-approved commercial products in the market. Recently, in 2017, we got approval for Brainura and ERT, or enzyme replacement therapy, for CLN2 disease. It is the first ever treatment where the drug is directly injected into the brain of the patients. With our BMN270 hemophilia A gene therapy program, Biomarin continues its commitment to bring first-in-class or best-in-class treatments to patients with unmet medical needs. So, what is lysosomal storage disorder? Here I'm showing you the disease mechanism. Lysosomes are the recycled bins of the cell where macromolecules like fat and carbohydrates are broken down into simple diffusible forms by a group of 50 lysosomal enzymes. As shown in the top middle panel, if a person does not have enough of one of these enzymes, the body cannot break down the fat or carbohydrate targeted by enzymes for recycling. These fats or sugars accumulate in cell lysosomes, disrupting normal function and causing lysosomal storage disorder. So what kind of pathologies can occur due to LSDs? Patients with LSD suffer with number of symptoms like damage to central nervous system and vital body organs, impaired physical development, facial and bone abnormalities without treatment, death at an early age. At Biomarin, our approach to treat lysosomal storage disorder is to replace the missing enzyme in body with a recombinantly produced enzyme in CHO cells growing in bioreactors that successfully restore the lysosomal activity. So how lysosomal enzymes are trafficked to the right compartment in the healthy cell? I have tried to show it here in this diagram. A specific sugar called mannose 6-phosphate is attached to the newly synthesized protein in the Golgi complex. This MP6 glycosylated protein is bound to mannose 6-phosphate receptor and the receptor ligand complex is transported to lysosome. Due to low pH of the lysosomes, the enzyme receptor complex is dissociated and the enzyme is delivered to the lysosomes. We employ the same mechanism for delivering the therapeutic lysosomal enzymes to patients. The mannose 6-phosphate glycosylated enzymes produced in CHO cells can be internalized by cells using mannose 6-phosphate receptors and transported to lysosomes and released in pH-dependent manner as described previously. As we know, CHO cells are known to be the workhorse of biologics manufacturing as they provided desirable glycosylation profile needed for the therapeutic enzyme activity. Here I'm showing you a brief history of various variants of CHO cells that are relevant from a biologics manufacturing standpoint. The first ever isolation of CHO cells was done by Theodore Puck in 1957. This becomes the original CHO cell line, often referred to as CHO-K1. Later on, several variants of CHO cells were derived where CHO cells were suspension adapted for superior scalability characteristics. For improved selection of transgenes, Urlaub and Chasen mutated DHFR gene creating DG44 and DuxP11 cell lines. And most recently, glutamine synthetase gene knocked out version of CHO cells have been extensively reported for the use in biologics manufacturing. For early stage discovery at Biomarin, we have three modes of protein production, either transient transfection, stable pools, or stable clones. We have seen that the efficient transfection is the most critical step in the success of achieving 
high amounts of protein from either of these three modes. We got some good results using MaxSight platform as post electroporation it gives high cell viability, which are critical for high levels of protein production in both stable and transient format. For our biologic therapeutic programs, we use clonal cell lines from the start, as oftentimes these lysosomal enzymes are very difficult to produce and give low titers using transient transfection. Thus, making a stable cell lines although time and labor intensive, provides us a renewable source of high quality material to perform the animal studies. When making stable Cho cell lines for therapeutic protein, random integration of transgene is still a prevalent method. Here I'm showing you two-step process that possibly leads to random integration of transgene in host genome. As a heavy load of linearized plasmid DNA is delivered to the cells, Double strand break or DSB repair pathways are induced in the cells. There are multiple pathways like homologous recombination, non homologous end joining, etc., that leads to plasmid plasmid recombination to form concatomeres. In the second step, these plasmids are integrated in one or more sites of genome randomly. Random integration of plasmid into the cell genome is a highly inefficient process. Hence, a large number of cells are needed to be screened to identify the clone with suitable expression and growth characteristics. This process is oftentimes referred to as finding a needle in the haystack. Usually, at early stage research, to accommodate multiple therapeutic programs in our preclinical pipeline, we keep a relatively smaller screen size and try to find just good enough clone that can be used for proof of concept studies. It takes around three months to generate a research clone. However, as the program is progressed into the clinical development, a much more extensive screening in addition to stability studies and process development is required to identify the top clones. This requires roughly nine to 12 months of extensive screening to select a clone at commercial stage. In general, cell line developers in biotech industry uses protein expression as a dominant parameter for clone selection, and later on they determine the genetic stability of the clones. This approach poses a significant risk as it is the genomic site of integrations that determine level as well as stability of expression. So we asked, is it possible to use both protein expression levels as well as genetic information of recombinant cell line to select the desired clones? We aimed at to determine integration sites, copy numbers, sequence of transgene after integration in Joe genome and any structural changes, single nucleotide variants in transgene. The idea is to select a top clone with desired clean genetic information. One of the major challenges when you try to sequence your integrated transgene in genomic context is the limited ability of PCR technique to amplify really long pieces of DNA efficiently. So we employed targeted locus amplification technology from Sargentis to evaluate its ability to sequence transgene and identify any structural changes or single nucleotide variation. Here I'm showing you a brief overview to highlight the key advantages of TLA. The coverage plot depicted here shows you that you can sequence 50 to 100 KB long pieces of DNA on either side of your locus of interest. TLA just requires one primer pair of 20 base pairs. It combines with low-cost next-generation sequencing, and there are both cell-based as well as genomic DNA protocols that can be used. Here I'm showing you a coverage plot showing the ability of TLA to sequence BRCA1 gene, which is 80 KB long. The blue arrow shows the location of the primer pair, and you can also see a small gap towards the right side of the map. This small gap is the limitation of Illumina NGS sequence to sequence the 80 rich regions. Another example of how YAG gene has been specifically sequenced in context of the entire human genome assembled in the chromosomes. The amplification is locus specific by primer pair showed in the blue arrow. Here is another example showing identification 
of either single or multiple genomic integration site. For example, in top left coverage plot, there are two locuses that got amplifying, showing the presence of two integration sites. However, in the bottom right, there are five integration sites as indicated by the presence of the five amplified signal. Now for Chinese hamster ovary cells, although TLA can be used as efficiently as shown for human and mouse cell type, only difference is that in mouse and human cells, genome is assembled into chromosomes as shown in the left panel. For Cho cells, genome is only available in form of scaffold representing long stretches of several thousand kilobase pairs of genomic regions. This is shown in the right panel. And for the mapping purposes, we have used Cho genome sequence publicly available at chogenome.org. I will give you a brief outline about how sample preparation is done for TLA analysis. The first step is to physically cross-link the genomic DNA using formaldehyde. This step basically cross-links DNA sequences that are located in close physical proximity to each other. Then the cross-linked DNA frag is fragmented. In the next step, re-ligation results into circles of approximately 2 kb in size. Then enrichment is done simply by inverse PCR using locus-specific primer pair. In this step results into preferential amplification of target locus of interest. It is important to note that although the amplicon size is uh, in this step is 2 kb, TLA can sequence over 100 kbs of targeted locus DNA. And here is how the circles form in the previous steps come from samples that have several million copies of genomic DNA, together resulting in millions of permutation and combination representing unique sequence composition in each circle. The sequences in close physical proximity of target locus will be included in these circles much more frequently. This allows, this also explains the coverage plot that we have seen before, which follows from high to low pattern when you move away from where the primer pair binds. I will now talk about the pilot project for TLA technology evaluation. In this study, we analyzed five recombinant Cho cell lines expressing therapeutic lysosomal proteins. The goal of the analysis was to determine integration sites of the transgene and host genome, assess the presence of structural variants surrounding the transgene integration site, assess the transgene sequence itself, and estimate transgene copy number if possible. Here I'm showing you the growth and productivity profile of two of the five recombinant Cho clones that we selected for TLA analysis. Clone 11 in orange is a research stage clone expressing lysosomal protein, and clone 752 in gray is generated at the later stage for the IND enabling studies. The top graph shows the growth profile of both the clones in the bent scale bioreactor. The graph in the bottom is showing the specific productivity of both the clones. The average titer of clone 11 is 150 mix per liter, and the clone 752 is 350 mix per liter. Let's have a look at the results now. The first piece of data is the coverage plot of the integrated transgene. Here we use two primer pairs, one specific to CMV promoter region and other specific to transgene ORF. As you can see, both the clones were sequenced with good coverage. The gap on the top and the bottom is the limitation of Illumina sequencing with the AD rich sequences, as I told before. However, the additional gap on the bottom panel with the clone 752 showed that a small part of expression vector got deleted during the integration process. As this portion is situated close to the site of linearization in the ampicillin selection marker, it doesn't interfere with the transgene expression cassette. The second piece of data is plasmid integration site for both clones in Cho genomic DNA. One large peak is found on one scaffold in the genome 
for both the clones, indicating this is where the transgene is integrated. Also for clone 752, integration of transgene leads to 18 base pair deletion in the genomic DNA region. Having information of plasmid integration in host genome at such a high resolution, we got excited. And we further probed to see if these integrations are disrupting any endogenous Cho gene. We use Genome Viewer from ChoGenome.org and I would like to acknowledge Karen Yu, the head of our bioinformatics group, to help us with this work. In the Genome Viewer, we put the information of the CHOA scaffold and site of integration we got from the TLA analysis earlier. And the yellow line here in the middle shows that the insertion is in the intergenic region and does not disrupt any endogenous CHOA gene. Similarly, for clone 752, the yellow line in the far left shows that the insertion is in the intergenic region and does not disrupt any endogenous CHO gene. DLA can also determine the fusion between two transgenes with high resolution. On the top is the expression vector map and below is the table showing the details of the transgene-transgene fusions. The orientation of the two plasmid fusions could also be determined here as head-to-head -head or head-to-tail and so on as shown in the table below. The first one is expected head-to-tail fusion as transgene is circular plasmid. For clone 11, we found four transgene-transgene fusions. Similarly, for clone 752, we found three transient transient fusions. This brings me to the summary slide. So we showed you how we employ TLA technology to sequence transgene and genomic integration site, the ability to determine single nucleotide variation, transient transient fusions, and genomic integration sites makes this an invaluable tool to genetically characterize recombinant CHO cells and finally, we can de-risk clone selection process by identifying clean integration during cell line development program, both at research and commercial stage. In the interest of time, I have not covered the copy numbers in details, but TLA cannot determine exact copy number. However, only an estimation of range of copies is provided. And now, I would like to thank all the people who have helped with this project, especially Karen Yu from Biomarine team for helping me with the genome viewer data. And also special thanks to Max Van Min from Sargentis to allow us to use some of his TLA slides for explanation purposes. And thank you all for your time and attention, and I will pass on to Joseph now. Thank you so much, Michelle, for that great presentation. In conclusion, I'd like to highlight some key benefits of the MaxSite scalable uh, transfection system. Uh, MaxSite transfection system is a versatile technology, as you've seen, that allows you to transfect any cell, any molecule at any scale, from cell genome editing, like CRISPR-based, to protein expression. And this protein could be membrane or secretive proteins like antibodies. Because the technology is electroplation based using chemical defined buffer, it allows consistency between transfections from scale of half a million to 200 billion cells. The technology can deliver molecules inside the cell efficiently while maintaining high viability, and therefore you can expect higher productivity for protein expression, decreased timeline for stable pool generation, um, and in general decreased development timeline. Finally, we have a team of dedicated scientists from gene and cell therapy to protein expression, and we work with our clients very closely in order to achieve their transaction goals. Thank you so much for joining our webinar, and if you have any questions, we will be more than happy to answer them. Okay, thank you, Vishal and Joseph. Um, we do have some questions. The first one is, what are the critical steps that lead to shortening of timelines and generation of your research clone? Uh, all right, so, um, you know, um, the way there are several um, examples in the literature, the way people have, you know, 
use the tools and the tricks to shorten the timelines. And as compared to you know what how we started generating the cell line in early 70s or 80s, um, so the main critical reason that I see that we use to shorten our timeline is that right after the transfection step, uh, instead of selecting a bulk pool, we put the cells into the 96 well plate in the selection media, and we have seen that you know this has provided an accelerated approach where we are reducing the selection process and we are doing the selection and the screening at the same time. So it gives a substantial reduction in the overall timelines to get uh, the stable clone. Okay. And how many clones do you look at in a typical cell line development project by TLA? So for the for the TLA right now, you know, in the pilot study, we have just uh, you know we were just evaluating this technology platform, so we just did only five uh, clones. But our goal is to select at least you know top five to six clones, and just to see before picking the top clone for the for the material generation, we want to see which of the clone has a clean genetic integration, and use it as information to make a decision for the selection of the top clone. And how high throughput is the TLA analysis? So TLA analysis, you know, it uses the it, it uses a combination of uh, you know some manipulation uh, of the genome and the usage of the NGS. So it is pretty high throughput, and uh, usually we used it as a service uh, with Sargentis this time, and they were able to give us the results in four to five weeks. But I'm I'm sure you know in terms of the throughput we can we can go as much as you know from few cell lines to uh, you know tens of the cell lines you know in one shot. Okay, and what makes lysosomal enzymes so difficult to express in show cells as compared to antibodies? Well, you know I'm still figuring it out myself. <laughs> um, the the primary reason, you know, first of all, uh, these like the enzyme, you know, cell has, as you know, you know, every protein has its own uh, personality. It presents, you know, in the cell, some proteins expresses, you know, better. It's a, you know, there are literature where people just, you know, try to give some sort of, you know, um, interesting. Uh, analysis that why one protein is expressing better than the other, but for the lysosomal protein, you know, if you see uh, when you express recombinantly in Cho cells, a part of the enzyme it doesn't only secrete, it also actually you know traffics the lysosome in the mechanism that I showed to you. So actually, it is not only secreting; it's also actually you know going to the lysosome. And one of the theory that we have in Biomarin is that you know this lysosomal enzyme when we when we make in Cho cells, you know it has a mechanism by which it can come back in the cell using the MANO6 phosphate receptors. So what it will be doing is that it's, it will be overloading the lysosomes and cr creating a same phenotype as you will see in the lysosomal storage disorder. So the expression of the lysosomal enzyme in the Cho cell is making the cells diseased and cell would not be producing much more protein when they are diseased. So this is one of the reasons I think um, it is difficult to express. And to your knowledge, does the FDA have a preferred integration site? Well, this is, this is like, you know, I think uh, emerging technology, and you know that FDA has a, FDA has a clear guideline that they want your production or commercial cell line to be fully characterized genetically, and the method so far is just copy number evaluation. You know, people are using PCR or qPCR to analyze the copy number, which is, which is of course, you know, quite, you know, people know that, you know, it is not an accurate representation of providing a clear fingerprinting or clear genetic fingerprinting to your, uh, to your cell line. Right now, we are in the process of uh, seeing and talking to FDA or, you know, even understanding uh, from various conferences. So far, I don't know the answer to this question, if there's a, if there's a specific genomic site. Uh, but we are still trying to develop our knowledge in this area. And is there a specific uh, performance ability of the MAC site platform that helped you the most in accomplishing the project goals? 
Well, I think uh, it's uh, for us it's kind of a very effective platform uh, in a in a way that you know it is tailor made for not only Joe and the Hexcel line. It is also tailor made for a number. It has a protocol already optimized for a number of cell lines. And one of the key features that we have seen is in addition to the high transfection, uh, high, high you know amount of DNA delivery, it gives you very high cell viability post electroporation, which is a unique feature I have seen in the electroporation field. You know, using different technologies, so this provides us an immediate advantage um, over you know other transfection techniques, and we prefer Maxite. Uh, for this. And have you found any correlation with clean genomic integration site and clonal stability? Mm. So as I said, you know, we are at a very nascent stage of understanding, you know, the correlation between uh, genomic stability and the integration site. I'm sure there is definitely a correlation. Uh, but the clones that we selected for this study is, is already, you know, picked as a top clone for us. Uh, so, in a way, it it gives us a confidence that the process that we used to pick up a top clone, you know, is good. But can we reverse this process? Can we use the genomic integration site to say that the clone will be stable? Will be very interesting. And over the time, when we do this analysis again and again on number of cell line we could just get some more data and talk about it. But at this moment, we have limited data and we cannot comment much on that. Okay, Michelle, and I think this is going to be the last question. Um, what is your selection method? Well, we are using a, a GS system here from Lonza, so the selection method is just, you know, removing the glutamine from the, uh, from the media. Okay. So thank you, Vishal and Joseph. Thank you. And thanks, and thanks to our audience for joining us. The recorded version of this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing on our website. And as a registered attendee, you'll receive a follow-up email providing us a direct link. We look forward to having you at us our future Bioprocess Ask the Expert webcast. We'll look for those announcements in your inbox. Thanks, and have a good day.